Welcome and thank you for standing by. All participants will be in the listen-only mode until the question and answer session. During that time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 and clearly record your first and last name for your question to be introduced. I'd like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you can disconnect at this time. I'd also like to turn the call over to your host, Ms. Linda Lee. Thank you, and you may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Linda Lee, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the Exploring Census Data webinar series. For anyone who may not be familiar with our format, the Exploring Census Data webinar series is a set of webinars presented on a monthly basis based on popular topics. The webinars are presented by our subject matter experts with the opportunity for Q&A at the end of each session. All webinars and Q&A sessions are recorded and will be accessible from the Census Academy's webinar tab once the recording and transcripts are available. Today's webinar on hidden gems is the seventh and final in our series for this year. This is our third installment of the series. We have all of the webinars from our previous series archived on census.gov, or you can also access them using the link provided on this slide. Now, in light of recent transition to 100% telework, we are utilizing technology offsite to continue operations. We aim to minimize interruptions as much as possible and we appreciate your patience if we experience any technical delays. Also, please note, today we will be focusing on data that you can obtain from the Census Bureau related to our public sector programs. We want you to be aware of all census products and programs for this sector of the economy. The webinar will not focus on additional topics such as hiring for the 2020 Census or our partnership programs. If you need additional information on any topic pertaining to the 2020 Census, please visit the 2020 resource site on census.gov. In today's webinar, we will go over a high-level overview about the Census Bureau and the structure of our programs. Then we will dive into the data from our programs. So you can see the types of data that you can obtain. The programs that we will be covering are the Annual Survey of Public Employment and Payroll, the Annual Survey of Public Pensions, the Quarterly Summary of State and Local Government Tax Revenue, the Annual Survey of State and Local Government Finances, the Census of Governments, and the Economic Census. And as part of the webinar series, we've included a section where we shine a spotlight on a program or survey as an added bonus for you. Today, we will be featuring the COVID-19 Data Hub. And after showing you the data, we will go into how to access our data and then close out with a Q&A section. The Census Bureau is the federal government's largest statistical agency. We conduct over 130 surveys each year with our well-known surveys listed here. Now, collecting data for the nation's people is the decennial census, which takes place every 10 years. And activities surrounding the 2020 census is currently taking place. Next is the American Community Survey. This is a program that collects demographic data annually. And for business statistics, the Economic Census is our most comprehensive program, taking place every five years in the years ending in two and seven. We also have the Census of Governments, which we will touch on later today, and this is the public counterpart of the Economic Census. Now, when it comes to our data, a pyramid is a good illustration of the relationship between details and timeliness. We primarily conduct monthly, quarterly, and annual surveys. In general, the more timely the data, the fewer the details, with more details available from our programs categorized in the middle and bottom of the pyramid. Now, with that being said, the economic census and census of governments are periodic surveys that take place every five years. It is illustrated here at the bottom of the pyramid because it is the most comprehensive program when you're looking for economic data. As you move up the pyramid to our annual programs, you will find that you can use these statistics for analyzing trends. And finally, at the very top of the pyramid from monthly and quarterly programs is where you can obtain timely data. And in today's webinar, we are going to be covering all three tiers of the pyramid. So when you use our data, there are some key terms and items that are helpful to know. Typically, when I present this information on our key terms, I talk about the information in the left column, as these are key terms for most of our programs. For this presentation, I've added information on the public sector equivalent shown in blue in the right column. 
first is the North American Industry Classification System, also commonly referred to as the NAICS. The NAICS is a system that we use to classify every business in the United States and is the primary dimension of business employment data. Each physical business location is assigned its own six-digit NAICS code based on the primary business activities at that location. Each individual business data are then turned into summary statistics that we publish by industry and geography. Now, in the case of public sector data, classification is based on functional categories. These are categories grouped by purpose, task, and or responsibilities. So for instance, example of functional categories include corrections, public welfare, and parks and recreation. Next is the term establishment as opposed to company or firm. Most of our employment data is collected and published on an establishment level. Now collecting the data this way allows us to provide the most accurate picture of business activity. So for instance, if a company has both manufacturing and retail locations in many states, separate data is captured for each location and not the company as a whole. Now, if we didn't collect data this way, we would lose the accuracy and geographic and industry detail. For public sector data, employment data refers to all persons gainfully employed by and performing services for a United States government. The collected data excludes federal employees and only represents state and local government employees. Third, we collect data from both employer and non-employer establishments. Some programs only cover employer businesses while other covers both. Employers are businesses that have at least one paid employee, while non-employer businesses have no paid employee. Now, depending on the industry that you're looking at, the non-employer statistics could represent a big portion of the sector. For instance, if you were interested in data on the daycare industry, you would want to include non-employer statistics to your data analysis because there are many daycare providers that do not have employees. So it's good to be aware of this source of data. Now in the public sector realm, the equivalent would be state and local governments, which also includes authorities such as the Economic Development Authority or the Transit Authority. And finally, we are bound by Title 13 and 26 to uphold and protect privacy. As a result, we are able to provide high quality data because respondents, well, they're more likely to provide information knowing that their privacy will be protected. So what's great about public sector data is that all the information and data are not held to the confidentiality laws and codes. What this means for you is that if you're interested in micro level data beyond the aggregate level, you'll be able to access these data. So what types of data are available from our public sector programs? Well, statistics from our program include data on expenditure, revenue, assets, debt, and employment, to name a few. When you explore our public sector statistics, you'll be able to obtain data from the state and local governments that perform governmental functions, such as the Water Authority. And other examples of functions include activities such as the administration of justice, managing economic conditions, and the provision of economic assistance and public services. Let's explore our first program, the Annual Survey of Public Employment and Payroll, also commonly referred to as the ASTEP. So government employees work to enhance the lives of people in the United States and around the world. The ASTEP is a program that can provide you with data on our civil servants. The ASPEP is released on an annual basis with the latest data available for 2019. From this program, you'll be able to get the number of state and local civilian government employees along with their gross monthly payroll for March. Now the month of March is used in order to minimize capturing seasonal employees during the holiday season and summer months. You'll also be able to get data by governmental functions and various dimensions of employment, such as full-time and part-time employment, full-time equipment employment, and payroll statistics. And some of the uses of the ASTEP data in the public realm includes governmental agencies from the federal to local level. The data are used in many ways, such as the inclusion of the data as a component of the gross domestic product estimates to legislative research. Now in the private realm, educational and research organizations can use the data to do comparative studies on wage and salary of state and local government workers. In an earlier slide, we talked about the use of non-employer statistics to complete the picture of employment for businesses by industry. 
So similarly, the ASPEP data in conjunction with business employment data allows you to see the complete picture of employment for a given geographic area. But there are some caveats. The ASPEP data is collected and presented by functional categories. So you, know, you will not be able to do an analysis by business industry. Another caveat is that anytime you mix business data with public sector data, you'll have to take caution at anything beyond the national or state level of geography. To enhance your research on this, we do have um, our American Community Survey, which can provide additional data on employment status, occupation, weeks and hours work, full and part-time status, and even the class of workers. You can also get data um, for private companies, governments, nonprofits, and self-employed. Now, before we move along to the next slide, on the right side of the slide, I've included some additional resources. If you're not familiar with America Counts, I highly encourage you to check out this first link. America Counts is a page on our site where we bring you the stories behind the numbers. This is a place where you can find Census Bureau's data in action. And the second link is where you can find a story on employment data in action. This slide shows key statistics from the 2019 ASPEP data. Here we see that in 2019, the state and local public employment in the United States show a total payroll of approximately 86 billion. With close to 15 million people employed as full-time, and close to 5 million as part-time workers. Let's take a deeper dive into the data. So here's a graph that shows data for the 2019 state and local full-time employment by government function. This graph shows the data at the national level. You can also get the data at the state and local level separately. You'll notice that there are a large number of people employed in the education functions as compared to other types of functions. And here's a similar graph that shows the same type of data for part-time employment by government function. Now, this is an interesting data point from the ASPEP. This graph shows data on equivalent full-time positions, which is defined as full-time employees plus part-time employees converted to represent their contribution in full-time terms. This is something that could be helpful if you're trying to get the full picture of a particular governmental function. So for example, on our earlier slide when we looked at the state and local full-time employment, the 2019 data shows that 399,045 number of people worked in the financial administration. Now, with the inclusion of part-time employees into full-time equivalents, we see that the amount of financial administration is equivalent to 420,051 number of full-time employees. This is a visual to show at a glance the number of state government full-time employment by state geography for the function parks and recreation. Now, as an added side note for everyone, um, natural resource is another function that is available from the ASPEP. And sometimes this function is looked at in conjunction with parks and recreation. Here on this graph, we expect to see larger states like California to report a higher number of employees so it's interesting to see Georgia employing a slightly larger number of employees in parks and recreation when compared to Texas and California. Now I've included a link here that leads you to the Georgia's infrastructure report card and also the Georgia's Department of Natural Resources where you can find details on the state's historical expenditures and their future plans. Our next stem from the public sector program is the annual and quarterly surveys of public pensions. As you probably already know, there is a great interest in the funding and structure of the pension system for public employees. And this data can add value to research on this topic. And even if you're not a teacher, police officer, firefighter, or a municipal worker, public pensions could relate to your business and industry in an indirect manner. Some of our users review public pension plans to see how they affect their state and local budgets. 
So the survey of public pensions is available at the national, state, and local level of statistics. Data from this program is available on an annual and quarterly basis with the most recent annual data release available for 2019. The type of statistics you can obtain include revenues, expenditures, financial assets, and membership information for state and locally administered public pension system. Now, some examples of locally administered systems include school districts and special districts. You can also get the data on a summary table that includes variables listed here. You can also download the table that includes an individual unit file and a summary report. And on the right side are links that will lead you to the unit ID file and methodology. And this is for anyone who may be interested in finding out more information on things such as population, data collection, and processing. So here are some key statistics from our public pensions program. The quarterly content provides more details on the asset categories, allowing for a clearer picture of investment environment. And the annual content focuses on the cash flow aspects, such as contributions and payments, memberships, and actuarial data. On this slide, the graph on the left depicts the 2019 data for public pensions, contributions, and earnings. Now, I personally always like to see earnings on investments. And in this case, nationally, the state and local pensions earned over $94 million. The graph on the right shows benefits and investments, and it looks like a majority of the investments are long-term in nature. On this graph, the total contribution is cross-tabulated with the total membership for 10 large pension systems. The blue bars represented, represent total contribution with its corresponding data in blue, and the orange bars stand for total membership with its data in orange text. Now, in the red circle, we see that for the 2019 reference years, total contributions for Texas and Illinois are comparable, while the total number of memberships are approximately half of one another. Circled in green, the same pattern can be seen between Pennsylvania and Ohio, with Pennsylvania reporting approximately half in the number of memberships to that of Ohio. Now, this chart shows the change from the end of fourth quarter in 2019 to the end of first quarter in 2020. We follow this quarterly distribution of assets because pensions are a huge part of the investment market, and the shift in pensions can move the whole market. Organizations such as the Federal Reserve use our numbers to see how pensions are acting in the market. And this is a chart that shows that benefits, represented in blue, are for the most part steady every year. And contributions, represented in orange, are also steady every year, but they are not enough to pay for the benefits. So we need investment earnings to meet our benefit obligations. And as you can see, investment earnings in orange are all over the place. This chart plots the S&P index of the stock market against the earnings of pension plans. You can see that the pensions move in the same direction as the stock market, but in a dampened way, which shows how much pensions are dependent on the stock market. And if you're interested in the tax aspect of government finance, the quarterly summary of state and local government tax revenues provides a summary of taxes collected by states for five broad tax categories and up to 25 tax subcategories. The annual survey of state government tax collections, also referred to as the STC, provides a summary of taxes collected by the 50 states' governments, as well as all dependent state-level governmental entities. Similarly, its quarterly counterpart, also commonly referred to as the Q-tax, is available as well, and you'll be able to obtain statistics at the local level. Now, data from these programs can provide details on tax collection by the type of tax imposed, and they are collected by state governments. Statistics include measurement of tax by five broad categories, and these categories include property taxes, sales and gross receipts, license income, and additional taxes. 
Now, each of these tax categories are then further divided into subcategories, which we will see examples in a moment. And there are many uses of these statistics to include federal agencies and state and local governments and educational and research organizations. The general public utilize these data um, to, for development of gross domestic product estimates to the development of national income and product accounts and also to do tax policy research. So here's a sample of the STC data. This graph shows tax collection by type at the national level. The total taxes is included in light blue there at the bottom. Um, so you can approximately see, for instance, how much of the sales and gross receipt taxes shown in gray contributes to the total tax revenue. Now I included this graph to show the subcategories. When looking at this, please take note that some of the taxes listed here are some nations of others on the list. So for example, Income taxes is a total of individual income and corporate taxes. Also, when you're doing a data analysis below the national level, if you happen to see an X, this denotes that the type of tax is not collected for that particular geographic area. So for example, Delaware does not have property taxes, so you would see an X. And here are some fun facts for you. Did you know that a sliced bagel can cost you more than uncut ones? Well, that's because depending on state and locality, cutting a bagel turns it into prepared food, which means additional sales taxes is added to the price of the bagel. Another fun fact, did you know that lottery winners take home more in some states? This is because state withholdings vary, and some states require additional taxes when filing a return. And on the next slide, we're going to take a look at an illustration of data from the QTAX showing the largest tax by state. This is an illustration from the QTAX from the first quarter of 2020. It shows the largest tax by type and by state. Here we see four types of taxes represented. Shown in different shades of blue and gray are individual income tax, general sales and gross receipts, severance, and property tax. If you're interested in diving further into the details of this illustration, I've included the link below the map that will lead you directly to the report. So far, we've been looking at various aspects of public sector data. So we've seen how you can use statistics for public employees to pension systems to tax revenues. Now we're going to shift gear and take a look at government finances where you can get data that you can use for many purposes, such as policy research or evaluations of facets that can help you make an informed business-related decision. Let's take a look at the annual survey of state and local government finances. The state finance program has a local counterpart. The most recent data was released last week on September 17th. Now, at the time when I was putting these slides together for this webinar, the data was not yet available. So the data that you'll see today is for local, for local government finances is from the 2017 Census of Governments, which we will go later into momentarily. Um, the 2018 statistics are up on our site and ready for you. The state and local government finances surveys are conducted annually and provide similar types of data. But just as the name suggests, you are able to obtain statistics at the state and local level of government by governmental functions. Data are collected using a sample with the exception of years ending in two and seven, where a census of governments is conducted. So you'll be able to get data on revenue by source, expenditure by object and function, asset by purpose, and debt by term for the 50 states and dependent state level governmental entities. When you access the data, you'll also be able to obtain summary tables for each state for each level of government. And some of the uses of the data include the development of personal income figures for state and county areas, legislative research, and public and fiscal policy analysis. Now, there is a caveat when you use this data. One such limitation is that the financial amount that you find are statistical, and they do not represent an accounting statement. Now, with that being said, you will not be able to do, perform a calculation such as taking the difference between the total revenue and total expenditure 
to find the amount of surplus or deficit. And if you're using state finance statistics for the first time, I highly encourage you to use the accessing the data link provided on this slide um, to find additional items to consider when using this data. On the right side of the slide, I've included additional resources that may be helpful for you when using this data. And of course, if you have questions, you can always contact us, email us, um, or call us um, with this information on the side. Let's take a look at some state and local finance data. Here are some key statistics from our most recent releases. And as you can see, total revenue, expenditure, and debt are shown at the state and local level of government. Um, the local numbers that you see here are from the 2018. This graph shows revenue by source for the nation. The data are also available at the state level. Here we see that for selected revenue sources, individual income and general sales tax contribute more in dollars when compared to other types of taxes. So on this graph, I've selected two states in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area to do a state-by-state -state comparison. Maryland is represented in blue, and Virginia is represented in orange. Here, circled in green, you see that Virginia receives more in dollars from individual income tax when compared to Maryland. Circled in red are revenue sources that are not present. In this case, Maryland does not receive taxes from liquor stores, while Virginia does. And the opposite is true for utility taxes. Now, some of our data users have looked at these types of comparisons to figure out the best area for their specific needs. On the expenditure side of the house, this graph shows expenses by governmental function between the two states. Now, something I want to point out on this graph, circled in green is expenditure for hospitals. Now, a quick glance at the data would suggest that there is a large disparity between expenditures and hospitals between the two states. This is really not the case. The hospital function is not as straightforward as other functions, and the expenses you see here include government-operated general hospitals as well as facilities that provide specialized care. And there are also other details that go into this item. So to get a full detail of the explanation, I've included a link for you here at the bottom to the classification manual. This graph comes from the Local Government Finance's 2017 Census of Government data. This is a snapshot of general revenue from sales and gross receipts. In these graphs, the local government is represented in orange, while state government is shown in blue. The graph on the left shows the overall difference in revenue between the local and state government for general and selected sales. The graph on the right shows the, the selected sales in detail. Now, it's interesting to see that the local governments receive more in dollars for public utilities, utilities when compared to state governments. Again, from our 2017 Census of Governments, this graph shows revenue from charges by type. Now, it looks like in 2017, charges from hospitals are sizable when compared to other types of charges. Again, from our earlier illustration with hospitals, please check out the classification manual for the specifics of this governmental function. On the expense side of the house, these graphs show expenditures by type. The graph on the left is expenditure on public safety, where we see that a large portion of the pie is in police protection. The graph on the right shows expenditure on environmental and housing. In 2017 fiscal year, it looks like spending on housing and community development is comparable to expenses on sewerage. And at the time of the creation of this presentation, the data for 2018 was not yet available. And these are preliminary numbers for expenditure for education by geography. Now, I randomly picked these states and districts to show two things. First, that you can get expenditure for governmental functions at the state and local level, as in the case for Maryland. Second, that you may see zeros in some instances, such as in the case for Hawaii and District of Columbia. And that's because Hawaii's educational system is state administered, while DC is locally administered. 
So health care expenditure represents a large portion of the U.S. gross domestic product. And here's an illustration of the use of state government finance data in conjunction with other Census Bureau statistics to do a research on the topic of health care. So you can get data from state government finances where you can have access to revenue and expense data from our demographic program, the American Community Survey. You can get data on selected characteristics of health insurance coverage. And some of these statistics are the number of insured versus non-insured by age, gender, race, ethnicity, um, employment status. You can also get occupational data on the healthcare workers themselves. And from the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, you can get data on the use of and payment for healthcare services. Now, the MEPS IC is a sponsored survey. What this means is that the Census Bureau conducts the survey and the data is available from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And the link is provided for you on the right. And this is just an example of how you can use our data. So the programs we've seen so far are public sector surveys that are conducted every quarter or year. Now going back towards the beginning of, to that pyramid slide, you'll recall that these types of data are timely and provide less details. The most comprehensive source for public sector data comes from the census of government, which is categorized in the base of the pyramid. The census of governments, also commonly referred to as the COGS, is conducted every five years in the years ending in two and seven. This is the public sector's counterpart of the economic census. So we saw a sample of COGS data a few slides back when we were looking at the local finance data. The uses of the COGS are similar to its annual counterparts, and it is the only source of periodic information that identifies and describes all units of government in the United States. Coverage includes all state and local governments, and local governments include counties, cities, townships, and special districts, such as water district, fire, library, and so on. Data are available in broad categories by how government are organized, how many people they employ, and payroll amount, and the finances of government. On the right, you'll find links that can lead you to several resources that may be helpful when using public sector data. The first link is the Government Unit Survey, also commonly referred to as the GUS. This is the organizational component of the Census of Government. The GUS collects information on the location, type, and characteristics of local governments and offices. And it is an updated list of local governments, and it serves as the source of the official counts of local governments within the United States. And I have an illustrated example for you on the next slide. Um, the next link, the classification manual, well, this is your friend if you're doing research in public sector. And if you haven't seen it before, I highly suggest you visiting this link. And finally, the last link is a quick access to the Cox. So here's an example of search results for the GUS. In this particular example, the table format was selected. And this slide illustrates what the search results will look like when you select tables. So along the left is a list of search results. The table is shown next to the list. And for this particular file, you'll be able to obtain government units from 1942 to 2017. And here's a data visualization that we call the state and local government snapshot. This is an interactive visualization which allows users to explore um, the revenues, expenditures, and employment of state and local governments. It combines several years of data from multiple government surveys in one place. So when you use this tool, you'll be able to obtain data from 2012 to 2017. This allows you to analyze data from one census of government year to another with the years in between as well. Now, at this moment, I'm not sure if there are plans on including additional years. So please stay tuned. There may be more to come on this. So within the tool, you can certainly customize it, and you can filter by the government type, and you can also select variables. Finally, the search results um, are shown to you on a map based on the criteria that you selected, and this is only a snapshot of it. 
When you're in the tool, you can scroll down and you'll have additional data. So up to this point, we've been talking about public sector programs that are able to provide you with data from the public arena related to the employment, pensions, and finance. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't include the economic census, which is not only the most comprehensive data source when you're looking for business data, it is also a survey in which we benchmark our business data. The census of governments that we just looked at is the public counterpart of the economic census. The economic census takes place every five years and includes nearly every two through six digit NAICS code. Now there are some exclusions, for example, NAICS 11 for agriculture. We have limited data on this sector, mostly revolving around the number of establishments and employment from selected programs, such as the county business patterns, the non-employer statistics, and the annual business survey. If you need additional data on this, the Department of Agriculture collects more extensive data on this sector. And a full list of exclusions are available on our website. And for ease of access, I've included a link for you here on this slide. Another great feature about the economic census is the level of geography. Now, while we do have county level data from the county business patterns and its zip code level counterpart from the zip code business patterns, the variables from these programs are limited. The economic census includes many dimensions, such as data by business size, and it includes over 200 plus variables. Here's an example of data from the economic census for the arts, entertainment, and recreation sector. In this example, I selected the six digit level NAICS code for all establishments for the state of Maryland. And I've also included two specific industries within this sector. As shown here, in Maryland, there are 11 number of establishments engaging in the preservation and exhibition of natural areas or settings under the NAICS code 712190, with approximately 58 number of people employed in this field. Now, similarly, there are six number of establishments in Maryland employing approximately 1,300 individuals for the amusement and theme parks. You can also find data from the public sector counterpart where NAICS 926110 includes arts and cultural program administration. And for anyone who has been using the economic census data, please take note of what's new for the 2017 data releases. We've had geographic area updates. There are areas that have been added and removed. So our site provides details of areas that have been updated, and we have a series of webinars apart from this series on just the economic census. This series started in the spring, and the webinars are presented by geography and by sectors. And we have all the recordings on our site if you're interested in this series. Another update may be found in the NAICS. So every five years, the NAICS are updated with codes that are relevant to contemporary economic activities. So codes that are not relevant are concatenated, while codes that are pertinent may be listed as a code of its own. Another feature, um, another update, I should say, is the North American Product Classification System, also referred to as the NAPS. The NAPS allows you to get data based on end products. We also have a new disclosure rule, which depending on the level of geography may or may not affect the data that you use. And finally, many of you may already be aware of our new data dissemination platform, data.census.gov, which replaces the American Fact Finder that was decommissioned at the end of March. So a great way to receive the most up-to-date information on data releases, upcoming releases, fun facts, and more is to stay connected with us on social media. Um, and here's an example of one of our fun facts, and we have many more that you will be receiving if you are subscribed. We have also created a way for you to find out information on the timing of our data products. The link on this slide leads you to a schedule of our product releases. Now, we began releasing our core statistics back in September of 2019. We have just recently completed releasing data by geography back in August. And as you can see, we are scheduled to release data well into 2021. 
Now, I highly encourage you to check back at the schedule every now and then because updates could occur. And now we have arrived at the part of this webinar where we showcase a program as an additional nugget for you to add to your data toolbox. Today, we are shining a spotlight on the COVID-19 Data Hub. This is your one-stop shop for data and resources related to the impact of the coronavirus on businesses and communities. So when you arrive at the Hub, you'll see that you'll have access to demographic and economic data at a glance. And as we hear in the news, age can be a risk factor related to the COVID-19. So right away, you can see that we've included the number of population age 65 years and older, along with the total uninsured population. Now on the business side, we provide the total number of employer establishments, as well as the total number of non-employer establishments. And as you can see, there is a larger number of businesses that report no employees. The at glance data are at the national level, and you can certainly customize the geography to the area that you're interested in. And on this page, you can customize and select the state and counties. This is the impact planning report shown slightly smaller at the national level on the previous slide. Now, I've made it bigger here, so you can see some of the data that you can obtain. In this example, I customized and selected Washington State without specifying a county. Doing so, you can use the arrow keys and go back and forth to see the data for each of the counties. And along the top, once you've customized your geography, instead of the national level, now you'll have key facts with demographic information for Washington State. The middle column has both economic and demographic data. And the columns on the left and right provide information on additional demographic statistics. So if you're looking to find data on how the current pandemic is affecting people and businesses, this data hub is your friend. You'll be able to find all the data that the Census Bureau has to offer on this topic in one location. So how do you access all the great data you've seen today? Well, we have a new data dissemination platform called the data.census.gov. This is our new platform that replaces the American Fact Finder that was decommissioned earlier this year. If you haven't done a data search on our site for some time, you'll find that data.census.gov provides you with a search experience similar to popular search engines where you can just start a search simply, simply by putting in keywords. And you can also do an advanced search if that's your preference. So right now, our public sector data are available to you from our site in various formats. In the future, you'll be able to use this platform to find your data. You can see illustrated here, the programs that we cover today are found by selecting topics. And we also have other data tools available not featured today. On census.gov, if you go under Explore Data, you'll have a list of all the different types of data tools that we have. To sum up today's webinar, our primary goal is to make our data user aware of our public sector statistics. And one of the major takeaways is that the census of governments is the public sector's counterpart of the economic census, both being the most comprehensive data sources for business and public sector statistics from the Census Bureau. And a final takeaway is an example of how public sector data touch our lives in ways that you may not typically consider. So here's an example of my average weekend. I love to go shopping. Uh, before driving off in my car, I need a valid driver's license. Statistics is available here. And I may need to get gas before going to the mall well, now I'm connected to the field sales tax. And I personally love shoes and purses. So when I buy a new pair of shoes or a purse to add to my empire, I've contributed to the data of sales and gross receipt tax. And what's better than a good movie every now and then? Well, you guessed it, amusement sales tax. And these are just a few examples. So you can see how statistics that you've seen today may touch your life in many ways and can help guide you to make various data-driven decisions. Thank you everyone for your interest in our data and for attending today's webinar. 
Now, as we are gearing up for our next series, we'd love to hear from you. If there is a topic that you're interested in, please feel free to reach out to me. I will add your suggestions to our list, and we truly value your opinion, and we strive to provide you with valuable information and resources. Before we begin our Q&A, if you have questions regarding the 2020 decennial census, please use the contact information provided here. We also listed information for our data dissemination specialists, and this is for anyone who may be interested in a hands-on in-person training. We have specialists assigned by geography that are able to provide you with this service. And as a reminder, we're focusing on Q&A on today's topic, and we will be accepting questions regarding public sector data. If you have questions on other topics, please feel free to send me an email or send us an email at census.askdata at census.gov. Also, in our virtual conference room with me today are several subject matter experts. So you may hear additional voices responding to your questions. And now I'd like to open up the lines for Q&A portion of this session. Operator, at this time, do we have questions in the queue? If you would like to ask a question, please press star one and clearly record your first and last name for your question to be introduced. Again, that is star one if you have a question. Our first question comes from Michael Russell. Your line is now open. You may ask your question. I'm sorry, that was uh, an error. <laughs> I didn't have a question. My apologies. No worries. So while we're waiting for the operator to queue up more questions, I just wanted to mention that um, the COVID-19 Data Hub that we looked at a few slides back, um, there is a pretty neat program called the Business Formation Statistics. And this is a weekly um, data where you can get the numbers of business applications at the national, regional, and state level. Operator, do we have questions in the queue? We do. Our next question comes from Steve Bob. Your line is now open. Yes, on the uh, slide where you showed the museums in the state of Maryland, can you explain the difference between establishments and firms? So, um, so I may need. Uh, I'm going to answer your question. So, establishments are single locations as opposed to firms. So, I don't want to. Uh, my first immediate thought is to use um, a company that that we all know, but I don't know if I can say names. So I'll just say, let, let's say um, our firm is more of a parent company and establishments are those different locations that the parent company own. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Dalla Charm. Your line is now open. Yes, hi. Uh, could you please put all the links to this webinar on the chat room so we can copy it and we can refer to it later? So um, right now, um, we do not have the, um, the slides posted. Um, it will be another two to three weeks before we have the slides posted, and um, you can certainly access it from our main page. Um, not our main page, I'm sorry, I misspoke, from census.gov under the Census Academy. Right now, there is not a link where you can access the slides. Okay. All right, thank you. Our next question comes from Robert Bond. Your line is now open. Yes, is there any way to get census data based upon United States Postal Service carrier routes? or a way to convert the census data to carrier routes? So I do not know the answer on that. I do know that on the, um, on the um, demographic side of the house, we do have data down to the track level. Um, I believe that um, for the business side of the house, the lowest level may be um, zip code, but it's not, it's not defined as postal carrier route. Is that is that something you're looking for, the zip code? I'm really looking for the postal uh, carrier routes as far as using the uh, Every Door Direct Mail carrier route program as far as finding 
potential customers for my clients. Oh, I see. I um so I do not I do not believe that uh, we define them as that. Of course, um, I don't know what's out there in terms of um, um, items that you are able to purchase from from private sources, where you can you might be able to overlay their map or on top of our map, especially if you use the Census Business Builder. Have okay, you used the Census Business Builder before? No, I have not. Okay, so on our site, if you uh, go to census.gov and you go to um, the data tools, um, check out the, the Census Business Builder. The Census Business Builder is where you can actually use our data, and you can also have purchased data overlay on top. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Leo Te Lobinito. Your line is now open. Hi, um, I was just trying to use the data.census.gov search mm -hmm. for, to try and find um, some data about advertising or advertising companies. And what I got was information about mining and manufacturing and construction. Um, I'm, I guess I'm wondering how one might refine one's search or perhaps, like, get some feedback on how to refine a search. Sure. So it sounds like um, that you may need to um, first identify your sectors by going to our next and um, looking up um, the industries that you're interested in and getting the code that way. Um, so this, what, what we can do is you can actually send me an email directly or um, call my branch line there. I think it's listed on this page. Uh, I don't see it. But um, you, can call, you can call my number there, and I can walk you through um, if you're in front of your computer on how to do the search. Okay. That might, um, yeah, that might be easier that way. Um, okay, I see your email. Great. I'll do that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 and clearly record your first and last name for your question to be introduced. Our next question comes from Delkis Perez. Your line is now open. Hi, I had a question about the economic census by year. I was curious when you say that um, the information is by state and local. Um, we are a city of less than 50,000 or approximately 50,000. Are we looking down at the level of a city? So um, that's a great question. Let me confer with one of my colleagues on this. Um, Steve, would you be able to handle this question? So I, I think the, the question is actually about economic census data and getting that at the, um, at the city level of, uh, you know, populations, cities of population 50,000. Um, and I, I honestly couldn't speak to that. I know, you know, they do the county business patterns, but the, the, the real thing when, when you're looking at, in, in a caller earlier with the uh, postal routes had, had something similar, when you're looking at smaller levels of geography, um, we generally don't release products that way because there are, we have um, disclosure requirements, and in order to release something at a lower level, it has to go through more extensive disclosure review, and some of it may not, um, you know, be able to be released at all. Um, but I honestly, um, I, you know, that might, um, Linda, that might be a, a better question for Andy as far as, um, you know, being able to get data at that level for the economic census? Sure. Okay. So, um, so caller, um, what I advise you to do is send me an email, and I'm going to forward um, your message over to my colleague who would be able to provide you with that response. Great. Thank you. Do you have, can you put your email in the chat? Um, sure. Uh, oops. It's on, do you see the uh, slide? That's on the Q and A slide right now. 
my I don't have yes. the chat up. Yes, yes, I do. So census ask data. Um, you can do that, or um, if for this particular question, go ahead and send it directly to me because I know where to send it to. Oh, I understand. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. I will. Mm -hmm. My next question comes from Janina Madoff. Your line is now open. Hi, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to find out what NAICS industries are within each geography. So instead of knowing ahead of time what your NAICS industry is that you're, that you're interested in, the reverse, where you have your geography units and you want to know what's, what is there. Okay, um, so I have not personally done um, a search that way. But I believe that if um, hmm. Chris, would you um, would you happen to know how to do that search? If you pull the state, it should list all the NAICS. What about smaller geographies like uh, ZIPs or census tracts? Same with the ZIP. I was looking up on that earlier call. I'm not sure if that was you, but on the cities, I think we go down the metropolitan area, the places, and the ZIPs. I'm not sure the city cities are included. And then we publish as much detail as we can, as mm -hmm. low as we can. Okay. So it's But if you pull the state report it should list all the NAICs included. Right. So if we're looking at a large metropolitan area, say New York, you'll get all the information for the entire city, so it's not that specific. So I was wondering if there was a way to get more specific. Only if it's included in the more detailed report, like the ZIP and so forth. Okay, so ZIP is sometimes included. ZIP is like the lowest level. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Our next question comes from Otikatu Emene. Your line is now open. Yes, my question is, how can I get data on the impact of COVID-19 on access to technology in the state of Mississippi? So um, I'm going to repeat your questions just to make sure that I um, understood it. Okay, so you're asking me how to get um, information on the impact of the COVID-19 for a specific state? Yes, on technology for a specific state, yes, for the state of Mississippi. On, I'm sorry, you said on technology statistics? The, the impact of access to technology, its uh, impact of COVID-19 on access to technology in the state of Mississippi. Okay, so um, I'm going to answer your question and um, I hope this covers what you're asking for. So um, if you go on to our site, and you look on that COVID-19 um, um, data hub that we went um, through towards the end of the presentation, there are um, a few surveys there that are able to provide you with certain types of data. For instance, one of them is the Small Business Pulse Survey. The Small Business Pulse Survey actually breaks down um, the different questions that we do ask of our respondents by sectors. So you'll be able to see how each sectors are affected um, at the same time. If you're looking at how it affects future businesses, um, that business formation statistics that I mentioned um, before the Q&A, um, that's a good indicator too. And it comes out on a weekly basis and you'll be able to see how um, business, like applications for business formation, whether it be at the national, regional, or state level. So I would, I would um, encourage you to go to that, um, to that hub and just play around with it and you'll find a wealth of information. And um, not only are you able to find information on the business aspect, you'll be able to find information on how it's affecting the people in the communities where these businesses are located as well. Thank you. Operator, do we have additional questions at this time? Our next question comes from Michael Russell. Your line is now open. Hi there. I have um, 
have some good questions for you now. <laughs> Great presentation, Linda. Thank you so much. So I Thank just want you. to make sure this is a lot of a lot a lot to process for me. But uh, is it my understanding that the, the kind of charts and graphs that you've showed us here today that that this the tools available can help us create those ourselves? So. Um Regarding the charts, um, basically they are um, charts that we either created through Excel, just using the data, just basically, especially if you're referring to the public sector data, um, a lot of the data are available in Excel or in um, other formats, and you can download it and manipulate it yourself. So I created the graphs myself by downloading the data and just selecting the, um, the variables that I'm interested in. Um, now, if you're interested in data tools that are able to create um, graphs and things like that for you, several of our data tools um, on our site, census.gov, will be able to provide you with, um, with maps and graphs and things like that. Um, it just depends on what you're looking for. Um, so for and instance, did, you say, did you say that some of the data has to be purchased, the private data has to be, or could no, be purchased? No. So, uh, nope. Um, Great news is everything is free and available on our site. Awesome. And do many people take advantage of the uh, additional training that you guys offer with the dissemination specialist? So I believe so. I'm not on that side of the house, but I do work closely with them on and off. And I do believe that they, we have um, specialists that are assigned to several states at a time, and they do go out all the time. And what kind of uh, assistance do they provide? So I was fortunate enough to be able to attend one of the um, one of the sessions. So what they do is, for instance, if you have a business, um, we go out and um, we do training on how to access the data, or specifically, like let's say um, it could be tailored to your sector or your industry. So it's it's really great. Um, if that's something you're interested in, um, I encourage you to contact them, and someone from your area will reach out to you. But I don't know at this moment with COVID-19 if they're going out, but we're talking about regular times. Sure. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Lisa Redmiles. Your line is now open. So I actually, well, another participant asked a similar question and I was able to get the answer. So thank you, but I don't have a question anymore. Okay, have a great day. Thank you. Our next question comes from Judith Robinson. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is similar to Michael's. Um, the, the graph, the color block that you used when you were showing the um, or public lands or national lands, I can't remember which slide it was, it was early on, uh, and it blocked it out visually. Yeah. Uh, are you talking about? Keep going. Um, I think I know further. which one you're talking about. Yeah, keep going. This Just, one. Yep, that one right there. How did you do uh, that? Um, that was in Excel. Really? Okay. Don't wait a That's... second. I'm sorry. I created so many graphs, my mind is spinning. <laughs> so, um, I believe so. That's in Excel. Um, yes. Huh. I'm, I'm going to, to say Excel. Cause, yep. You can yeah. actually go there when you're in Excel, and um, when you um, so when you do when you select your data and you select recommended, you don't have to take the recommended. The recommended is probably best for the type of data that you, are, you want to represent. But um, if you go to more types of graphs, it's listed in there. Perfect. I love, I love Excel, so <laughs> I have another <laughs> new toy. My next and, question. And, oh. Oh, I apologize. You can continue. No, I was just going to say, I've been attending these weekly, and I'm learning so much. So thank you so much. This has really been illuminating. Well, thank you for your interest. Our next question comes from Kevin Kiffer. Your line is now open. Yes, I was uh, interested in uh, uh, finding out does the Census Bureau uh, maintain any uh, data connections related to uh, uh, more historic or uh, archaic uh, data sets of uh, inhabitants uh, prior 
prior to statehood uh, through territorial or frontier, frontier areas? So I do not know the answer on that, but the best source that you, for you is to contact the, um, I believe it's called library, this, the, ooh, I don't remember the acronym right off the top of my head, but there is a source that um, you can send me an email and I'll, and I'll send the information to you. I don't remember the acronym, on, I mean, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but um, there is a source where they archive, they have archive data. Now, the only thing I have to tell you on archive data is, of course, you're probably already aware that some of them are PDFs, and so they're not always um, user-friendly, but it's, it's available somewhere, and there is a place where, I think it's called the Federal Depository Library. That's what it's called. Okay, so thank you very much. Yep. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Ruth Dickinson. Your line is now open. Thank you. My question is also prompted by the Maryland slide, which was shown earlier in the presentation. And the fact that there were only 11 museums listed in a particular NAICS code for Maryland made me question about the data, because 11 sounds suspiciously low the number of museums in Maryland. Museums, historic sites, and similar institutions. Well, I guess I do 11 plus 11, so 22. But still only 22 and 58 employees, but you think about all the historic areas in Maryland, how could there only be 22? So I'm going to answer your question, and then I'm going to confer to my colleague, Chris Blackburn. So my, um, my part is, I believe that when, especially when you go down to the lower level NAICS code, it gets very specific. So you would actually have to look at that specific NAICS code and see what's in there. It's not the higher level NAICS. So if you um, are familiar with our codes, the lower the level, the more specific it becomes. Um, so for instance, if it was a two level NAICS code, it might be something like footwear with three level. It might be leather footwear or, I mean, some types of shoes, and, and then it gets specific. Like, when you go to the six-digit level, you could get to something like high heels or something. I'm not saying that that's true. I'm just giving it for example. So my, my take on that is that you would have to investigate this next and see the specifics of it. It's not at the higher level. Um, Chris, did you have anything to add to that? What was the second part of our question? What um, most, most Ma'am? Let me ask a follow-up, because I did understand what Linda had to say about the NAICS code. But how do I interpret the firms and establishments? This goes back to the question that was asked earlier. If there's 11 firms and 11 establishments, is that 11 plus 11, or are they equal? Is that the firms listed there are also the establishments? And then the same for amusements and theme parks. There are six firms and six establishments. Does that mean there are six in the state, or are there 12 altogether? I think it's the first one, the six. Yeah, I, was, I noticed that, uh, what you're noticing too, I, I, they were the same. And so in that instance, it'd be like six individual companies with one location each. And how would one actually discern that when you're looking at the summary data? In this case, it's by the counts. When it gets to be more of, you know, large accounts, you know, the, usually the establishment count is going to be greater than the firm count. Because each location is an establishment, so each physical address. Okay, that so, becomes clearer. Thank you. Okay, okay. And did you have, did we answer your next question about the details? Well, basically, Linda was saying that it's because it's a six-digit NAICS code. So maybe whatever that NAICS code refers to restricts it so much, there really are only 11 museums, historic sites, and similar institutions of that particular NAICS code. And if right. you wanted to look at the right. total number of museums, historic sites, and similar institutions, 
then I should look for, say, a four-digit or three-digit NAICS code. Correct. Yeah. And, yeah. And another thing I'll add to that when, with uh, museums and historic sites, a lot of those are publicly run, and in those cases you won't see those in the economic census at all. So you got to know what data you're getting. When yeah, you're um, you know, I mean, if you have a some, you know, if you have a historic site run by a state park agency or something like that, that's going to show up in the public sector data, not in the economic census data. Okay, thank you. And I am showing no further questions at this time. Thank you, operator. At this moment, I'd like to express our thanks to everyone again for attending today's webinar. And this concludes today's presentation. Have a great day.